Hi, everybody. And here we are, another Wednesday session. This is Kim and Philip Lale, Fourth Wall Theater Company, Beyond the Fourth Wall. And our guest tonight is Auden Thornton, native Houstonian, uh, makes good out in Hollywood and New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but we get to have you back tonight. We're so excited that you're our guest. Thank you for being here. So happy, happy to see you guys and be yeah. here. Yeah. So Auden told us before we went on that she's coming to us from Bozeman, Montana. Mm -hmm. And why is that, real quickly? So this thing is happening in the world called COVID. I used to live in LA. Uh -huh. no, um, it hit and I was actually working in New York and that got canceled. Flew back to LA um, where I'd been living for just nine months. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a scary time. And um, about two days after I got back, I was like, I'm gonna go fly home and be with my parents. I would have been in an apartment alone. Yeah. yeah. And I just felt like I wanted to be with family. So we flew back to Houston um, yeah. and they had decided to move already to Bozeman, Montana. And so I packed up the house. Um, they still had their jobs and I, like, I helped them move here. All right. got here in May. Not a bad place to have to sit and yeah. be quiet and have some time to yourself while you wait, hopefully for things to get back to normal in the near future rather than far future. So we're all hoping and praying for that, but. So, um, so, so our audiences don't know much about you because um, we haven't been able to get you um, to come do anything at Fourth Wall Theater. We haven't yet. quit yet. <laughs> We've, I think we tried a couple of times, but, yeah. but let's, tell, let's tell a quick uh, Audie Thornton story. And we'll start by, I, I wanna ask you what you remember about when we first met, because we've known each other a long time. You both look great, by the way. Oh, thanks. So you. Yeah. You look great. Really for a long amazing. time, I was like, you guys don't look that old, though. So anyway, so. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, um, I think I was 11, 10 yeah. or 11. And um, I think it was my first year at the Alley that you were there, too, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know it was your first year. I seem to remember that I was playing the, uh, the, 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 young okay. Scrooge part and and, yes. and weren't you like young Belle or something and never I never got to play young oh. <laughs> no, but I love playing the Cratchit um Victoria Cratchit Snow yeah. Kid Carolers um yeah sisters so, were were uh, Tiny Tim sometimes so oh yeah but, yeah yeah and I loved I loved those Christmases so much and just getting to watch everyone work and you were always so kind. Oh. So um, he was always good with the kids. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that's true because you know the as anyone who's in that show will tell you it can be it's kind of a grind and um for the for the adults anyway and then one of the great things about it is to have the, all these kids like <laughs> you who are enthusiastic and so happy to be there and you know yeah. that always made it um a lot more fun than it would <laughs> Otherwise. But um, but you, that was not even close to your first acting, professional acting experience, oh. was it? Um, no, I had been doing some professional stuff in Houston. I did some Main Street Theater. Yeah. Beth was one. Um, played Macduff's son. Oh, and being right, yeah. Um, I was doing lots of stuff at St. John's School. I went to lots of school plays and actually a movie that shot in Houston, Arlington Road. Um, oh, I think we have a little picture of <laughs> the and there she is. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Amazing. That, was cool. <laughs> that was a major movie. That was a big part. It's a good movie. That was great. It's, yeah, it's unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that happened because it was shooting in Houston and you, how did that happen? It happened. I had um, a good friend, a really dear person. Did you ever know Curtis Billings? Sure. So he, um, I would do shows at University of Houston growing up when they needed a kid with Beth Sanford and Curtis was always in them. And uh -huh. he was just such a wonderful human. He was kind of like a little guy. He was like, you should be with my agent. You should do this play, this, 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 um, really early on. And because of him, I signed with his agent at the time, um, Quaid, uh, 
it was my first audition. It really spoiled me. I thought it was just going to keep. Ah, it was just going to be. In Houston, and they needed, you know, local local kids. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay. So, but. But this is interesting to me because, like, I found I remember seeing a play in my um, in my elementary school when I was in fourth grade. So I was about eleven years old, and I saw this play that the sixth grade teacher put on with her kids. And I was, you know, immediately that's the I can trace that as the moment that I knew I wanted to be an actor, or at least was interested in it, you know. And but here you were at the age of like five or something being interested in it. What? How did? The, why? It was like, it was, I think it was about seven or eight. I don't remember the first play I saw, weirdly, that made me want to do it. Um, I loved movies so much. And uh, St. John's, the school I went to, randomly decided to do, I think it was first grade, they decided to do Oliver. And they decided, the high school, it's K through 12, um, they decided they wanted it to be an all school play, which was really rare. And I loved that movie so much. Mm -hmm. And I felt compelled to audition, even though I was terrified, sobbing the night before, oh. you know, so scared. <laughs> Not much has changed. I'm kidding. Well, <laughs> I'm not terrified too, right? Yeah, that, that, that doesn't change, You're right? <laughs> but um, I just felt really. I loved seeing plays. I loved stories. I loved actors, and I thought, you know, just seemed like a superpower to be able to move people like that and really fun to go to different worlds. And so did Oliver and then things kind of, as a kid in Houston, things flowed. It felt like there was a lot of opportunity to do theater. My parents were so supportive and there was stuff going on at school. So I felt, yeah, yeah lucky to be able to, I always, my, my whole life, I feel like I've been able to watch people who are a lot better than me Aww. and just like, Grow, like osmosis grow like at the alley in Houston at Juilliard with my classmates I don't know I always just feel like I've been lucky to get to see great actors work yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then you left you left Houston before you finished high school I know you you tell us where tell us where you went and and why and then how that eventually became a you know you going to Juilliard can you tell us that part of the story Yes, so um, again, I think it has a lot to do with a Houston actor, Todd Waite, whose acting classes mm -hmm. I took. Yeah. Um, he was really a mentor and a guide. Um, he was on me a lot. Uh, I think I started his acting class was when I was about 12 and he was just like, work hard that kind of thing. <laughs> and he also really believed in me and that was meaningful. Um, and so, I went to summer camp at Interlochen and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And I got back and I just felt like, that was after my freshman year, I felt like um, I just, I wanted to stay there. I never thought I would want to go to boarding school. Yeah. Love my family, I, I loved Houston, but it was such a, a gift to be around. It was a, kind of like an early college, just to be around artists all the time and uh, get to, you know, not have to do much math or science, which I was horrible at. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he helped me with my audition. And, um, and, and then I went and loved it. And then that was really, that was very, it was such a beautiful experience. It was one of the happiest times, I think. Um, and, was very helpful in terms of getting going to Juilliard. Todd also helped me with my auditions for Juilliard as well. I mean, kept in touch, but yeah, it was kind of the the trajectory of well, that. I, I want to mention something about what you're talking about for anybody who's listening that I think is really vital that really touches me and makes me feel good as a teacher. Mm. Um, and and the fact of you know Todd being such an important part of your life. And I know Todd, and I have the utmost respect and admiration for him as a teacher as well. And, you know, he, and for all teachers that for students and for young people who come up and immediately for whatever reason, and, and a lot of times it's a mentor and it's a teacher, grasp on to the importance of training and continual training. And the fact that, you know, when you're in an environment, you're always looking for that artist who's the inspiration for you, the one that has that thing that you're trying to gain and to get better. And um, that, that, that mindset is a part of how you view things and that, that, that admiration of the thing that you don't know yet, the way to get a little bit better, to constantly seek 
out people who inspire you. That is a really true gift to me that not all artists possess. And I think it's really, it's really, I see it in your work. And I want to compliment you that that's something that's really uh, wonderful that you picked that up early. And if Todd was a big part of that, I'm so happy that you found Todd. Um, and, and I want to encourage people who are watching or people who are listening that are artists in any, well, any realm to find that mentor and those people that help you find your own true voice and your own true desire to always learn. I don't know if you feel that way, but I feel like that's a really vital part of enjoying what you do. Yeah. yeah. For me, in fact, to be honest, right now, I, would, I feel like I'm on the market for a new teacher, that new person. It's been a long time and I kind of needed to find my own and figure things out on my own, but it's, it's one of the like sweetest, most important relationships is like having that person who sees you and who you can trust and who is just, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give you two names in LA when we finish this of the two teachers I had who were probably two of the most important people in my life. Cool. So there you go. You're going to get that up for this interview. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. If anybody's watching and wants those names, I'm sure Tim I'll will give them, them to you too. too. <laughs> anybody who's watching and wants them, I'll give them to you too. I've always believed in sharing the wealth. Really great teachers. It is also about just finding that match of what's going to like unlock you to the next level. So that's really right. Well, that you know, that's some, another thing that you and I share. Of course, is that we both went to Juilliard. Um, you know, a long time apart. But there's this remarkable thing about Juilliard in that you studied with actually quite a few of the teachers who taught me. Uh, because they stay right, and and so you know, and we haven't really talked about this. I don't think that much, or uh, whatever. But like, was there someone there who you, who was a mentor to you, or is there someone else? I mean, Todd, you've mentioned already, but like, is someone at Juilliard or someone else in your life who who you count as a a mentor? Um, did you have was Richard Feldman there when you were there? Well, uh, in, interestingly, Richard. <laughs> Richard was did his first directing job with my class, and I was the unlucky half of the class that was not in that show. Mm -hmm. But I saw it was our third year, and then I saw so I saw a couple of things that he directed, and I think he directed some other people in my class. I never got to work with him, but um, I've been in touch with him lately, and um, uh, I, I'm a huge admirer of him. So tell us. You tell us yeah. what your experience is. And then we'll tell you what our new future yeah, plans that's are that's worth with the uh, Juilliard program that we have at Fourth Wall. Yeah. Cool. So we'll tell you, maybe sometime you can come do it with us. Cool. <laughs> um, right. So, so many wonderful teachers uh, there during my time, at least. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure you have Moni too. Um, I just mean the climate is, was quite different when I went. Um, I think than it used to be, but Moni was, Moni's amazing. I would say the two teachers who were, had the greatest impact were Richard and his wife, Carolyn, who taught, Richard was sort of head of acting and Carolyn taught Alexander and energy work. Oh, and yeah. that class, her teachings were so, they were like the key for me to get out of my planning head and my self-conscious body and just like really click into energy and more of a kind of open channeling and and um they're amazing they're amazing teachers yeah and richard just has this zen silent way of just like listening and taking in everything and he's kind all about kindness i don't want to work with anyone who's not like kind I, I i really don't <laughs> who's a teacher or a director i think life is too short but he's yeah um he really sees people and that's also confronting but it's good and <laughs> he's kind about it so You're right it's i think that's an important thing to learn how to do as a teacher is to be able to push people past where they're comfortable and make them challenge themselves and step out of their comfort zone and you have to push that but you have to be able to do it in a way that is loving and generous so they are they trust you to go somewhere that they're not safe yes yeah and if you if you don't have that if you're not that really soft place for them to land they're not going to do something frightening 
Yeah. yeah. So inter you, you mentioned that Juilliard was different when you were there. And, and so just so people understand, I'll, I'll describe what it was like when I was there. After two years, there was a cut. You were told this at the first day, <laughs> they're gonna cut the class. And we didn't know, didn't know how many, didn't know, you know exactly how it was gonna be. And so for the first year and a half, everybody in the class, and I, I responded horribly to this because it, it, it made me work hard, but on the other hand, it also made me afraid the whole time of making a mistake. And so, you know, and then the cut happened. My last two years were a lot more happy <laughs> because I didn't get cut. Yeah. Um, but, um, but so, but by the time you got there, that. was Jim Houghton running the program then? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this wonderful man named Jim Houghton, who I knew a little bit when I was a kid, was running the program then. And so describe what it was like when you were there. It was his second year in charge. It was his first year to choose a class and do this sort of large callback final 40 so that they could officially forever cut the cut system and just spend a lot more time committing to a class of 18 people that hopefully no one would need to be cut unless there was, you know, some severe Problem or something. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, he, again, kind, innovative, great energy, so curious. Um, uh, yeah. So did you feel safe and, you know, supported the whole time you were there? I didn't, but that's because of my own. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't. Yeah. I do plays. I still feel like I'm like I may have in been danger. the same way. I, who knows? Yeah. yeah, I think there has to be a little of that as an artist. You know, yeah. like I listen to like what is it? Um, who was it? Julianne Moore said in an interview that every time she takes a play or well a screenplay, whatever, she calls her agent a week before rehearsal start and she goes, "Get me out of this. I'm I can't do it." I'm not good enough. I can't do this part. Get me out of it. And the agent always goes, okay, I will, Julianne. And she doesn't do anything. Because she knows I, it's a lie. She's like, well, she knows it's this process she has to go through where she's yep. terrified and she wants to run away from everything. I'm like, yeah. I always feel like that. Yep, always. Yeah. I did something similar for, um, I had one lead in a film and uh, it was a great experience, Beauty Mark. But I got it and then a year later, we didn't shoot for a year. It, we couldn't, there was no funding. Didn't know what would happen. Oh. And then a month and a half before, a year passed, a month and a half before it shoots, I get a call, like, it's going, it's really going. And I called the director and I was like, I, I don't think I'm the right Like we had a meeting and I was like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm the, I don't think I'm the right person anymore. Even though I really wanted to do it. And right. It was like, so scary. Well, yeah. Well, you were wonderful. <laughs> Let's show the, like, like the little picture of yeah, it anyway. Yeah, we watched this movie. And a, we watched it two days ago, days ago and it ago. is wonderful. Really, your work is so it good. It is so Audie. good. And she and Audie won a, a Best Breakout Performance Actress Award in the Los Angeles Film Festival. And um, we would play this trailer of her screaming there, but I, it's not running very well. Or you can watch this movie right now on Amazon for free. So you should go to your Amazon account and watch it for free. That's what we did. That's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so there she is yelling, and that's a really great scene, by the way, too, where she gets uh, gets a little gets a little bit up on her mom there. Yeah, and <laughs> Auden is the the lead of this this movie. She's in yes every scene? everything. You're basically on screen the whole time, almost, almost every scene. Not quite. Not but, quite. There's a couple mom scenes yeah. without you, and a couple things, but uh, but so there let, you go. So talk a little bit about something that that we don't know. Well, we know it a little bit, but but you know better because you've done more work. Um, but the transition from you you you've been you've been in theater all your life and then and you train at Juilliard which is you know theater training uh, it's acting training but yeah mm -hmm. and then then you're out in New York for a little while and you did a, you did a play that we saw at Red Bull Theater yes. uh, just pity she's a whore and yes. you may have done some other things that are escaping me but then you've had success on screen so what 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 happened what did you have to do or change if anything for that to be true. Or to make that transition, yeah. yeah. First of all, just getting comfortable with the different relationship with the camera. That's a nebulous way to describe it, but it's obviously just so different energetically. So getting comfortable with that different energy level. But I was thinking about this recently and I feel like the thing for me that um, I'm still continuing to work on and that I transitioned a lot is tr like being very, not being lazy with your thoughts and just trusting your thoughts. Um, it's not that I 
didn't do thought work with stage, but you're thinking it's like, I did so much energy body work to tell the story and the movement of the play kind of takes you and you're telling with voice and with feeling and all this stuff. And um, with the camera, being really curious and meticulous about, about the thoughts. Um, I don't know, that shouldn't be different than the stage, but just trusting that just thinking the thoughts will have an effect on your body and your energy and, or asking the questions, even in your mind, sending up that energy and not needing to put more on it. And also just, yeah, feeling, feeling safe with the camera, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it, it absolutely does. does. How did you do it? Because you can't, I mean, it's, or did you, or maybe you did practice it. I was going to say you can't practice it. I guess you could, but, but um, was it Beauty Mark where you were in front of the camera for, I assume, a lot. What, four or five weeks or something every day? Or, you know, I don't know how long you shot, but what, what was it that allowed you to learn that? I think doing a lot of self-tape auditions. <laughs> you start to have to watch yourself a lot, which is, was very brutal at first of just like, but then it's such a great, you know, masterclass of getting curious about, okay, this is, I thought I was telling the story so much more clearly and I'm not. And just watching yourself with all these self tapes, um, that's kind of often the norm, definitely the norm now, but in the past, I guess, mm -hmm. five years, really so many self tape auditions, um, taking classes, taking some kind of on camera intensives in New York, Bob Krakauer was one. They oh, did. I've heard a lot of people talk about Bob, that he's a great person to take classes from. Yeah, understanding the frame and like yeah. each movement can tell a story in a powerful way. <laughs> you know? I, know, right, right? I know, I'm way too much movement. I'm always like, I'm always like, come on, what are you talking about? And I'm like, <laughs> I have to reshoot myself when I do these things all the time because I'm like, so, um, you know, and I'm like, what are you doing? Just sit still, Kim. Were there people you worked with in in um, in video projects that that like you went, oh, that person's doing something that I should do. <laughs> you know, it's okay. You know, okay. I always cool. notice a level of relaxation with um, like on times when I've been guest starring on TV shows. Um, there is really a level of relaxation and improvisation happening that I think the camera really likes is like the spontaneity, the not planning, the natural sort of that kind of thing. And so um, that's something I've noticed a lot, just like a calm, even in a scene that would require a lot, just I a, agree. Um, yeah, centeredness. I also feel like, by the way, Beauty Mark, we only we shot it in 12 days. Oh my what? God, stop it. Yeah. Wow. You must have I forget how crazy exhausted. they make those independent film schedules are. They basically yeah. work you like 15 hours a day, tell you to sleep for four hours and come back and do it again. <laughs> oh. It was oh actually helpful God. for that project though because she's in that state. Yes, she is. She's an emotional wreck for the whole show. So there you go. <laughs> Just let me sleep two hours, give some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, sometimes it's a blessing to be exhausted in a wreck. Works yep. for the book. There you go. Oh my gosh. Right. Well. Um, so now, what are you? What are you doing now? We know that. Uh, we know you did some guest stars, uh, like a whole season of guest stars on Us and Them, right? This is us. This, this is, us. is us. This is us. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Here we go. There's some pictures of you having a baby and yeah. and uh, your family and and your love interest there. So tell us a little bit about that. So, I. Um, Decided I wanted to, I spent a little bit of time in LA, but I've been in New York for about 10 years and I decided, kind of hit me, like I really, I want to go to LA. I, I need to go to LA, um, just for life reasons, even more than anything else, uh, friends and lifestyle. And I got this role off of self tape the week that I got there. Wow. That's amazing. It, That's like your Arlington Road story. There yeah, welcome to LA. Welcome to LA. Here's a big... The biggest series on television. Oh, that's so nice. That's amazing. But um, um, it's funny the things like sometimes I feel like in life. I don't know if you guys have felt this. 
like the things that I work so hard, like not that I wasn't working hard for this role, but you work hard, you work hard, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then suddenly the universe is like, over here, you can have this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know, just suddenly randomly. And I had very little time to work on it. And anyways, I love the show. I actually had not watched it. And the show is so, the actors are wonderful. I'm so inspired by them. It's about love and family. It's so beautiful. So my roles, um, uh, a smaller role, but I am it, part of the family now. I'm yeah. Grand, granddaughter-in-law, grand- I think so, oh. right? Granddaughter-in-law, yeah. Or if you start with the core. Um, <laughs> but it's been really fun. Everyone is, is wonderful on it. Yeah. Really great energy. Very, awesome. very lucky. And I hope that they, I hope they'll start shooting again this fall and yeah maybe you'll get to come back yeah okay. also right. too. Um, we know you had another huge success that may or may not be still happening but you can tell us about that i know you've got cast in the sequel to 30 something i love that show when i was growing <laughs> up i'm the 50 something mother now <laughs> you see yeah. um Amazing. It was so cool. It was really exciting. Yeah, we got that right before um, pandemic hit and uh, was very excited. It's my first time to get a series regular job and I loved the creators so much, the original cast. I was really over the moon. Everyone that uh, the new, the new young crew for 30 something else was really great people too. So, um, yeah, we were really excited and Corona hit, so we did not get to shoot the pilot. We did oh. rehearse for a week. We had a read through um, and everything got put on hold. And now it doesn't look like ABC will pick it up. So the creators are looking for another home for it, hopefully a different platform. Okay. Um, talk about how did you learn how to act in front of the camera? I don't feel finished with that at all. Probably we never feel finished, but I was so excited to to hopefully, you know, have it been picked up, get to show up on set every day and just learn from these people, again, who have just yeah. been doing it way longer and, and kind of have that master class. I was really excited. So we'll see if it, if it finds a new home or if there's gonna be another project. Well, it just that. goes to show that, you know, we're all of us that are artists right now. And for anybody who's watching that is a fan of TV, film and theater, we're all of us that are, dedicating our lives to being artists and bringing you guys stories. We're all sitting at home right now, planning for our next job and hoping that those things happen, but we're all out of work and we're sorry you're out of work. And we look, you, we know that it's all gonna come back. We're all gonna have jobs again. And if you don't have that show, we can't wait to see what you get next. So, yeah. cause it'll and, just be a matter of time. You know, I think you're preaching to the choir with Kim and me, of course, about the fact that you're not done learning how to act. Um, we, we both feel that well, that You're never we're done. always learning, you know, I mean, we mostly do theater now, obviously, but um, I, I, I'm always like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I want to, I'm going to try this new thing and see if, see if it works. I learned so much. When I met Kim 12 or 13 yeah. years ago, I, she rocked my acting world, <laughs> which had remained. He's so nice. Well, it had remained, you know, I, I'd, I'd come out of Juilliard and thought, I know what I need to know. <laughs> And then I got, then I started working, you know, and I, I, I did see people that I admired and, got, and I thought, well, how are they, how are they doing that? Or I watched some classmates of mine, you know, make some really good films and go, how did she learn how to do that? You know, and <laughs> still wonder sometimes about that, but I, I went on and on and on. I sort of had my way of working mm. and then I met her and, and she, she really changed my ideas about acting. So, yeah. So it's great. It's great that we hear a little bit about that. I'm well, I, you know, I'm, uh, I have always trained. You know, I'm one of those people that, uh, because I didn't finish my school and I came out to New York, uh, I didn't finish college, and I went out to New York because I was a little bit older, and I started training in conservatories, and I spent a lot of years with Gene Franklin. I don't know your teachers would know who Gene Franklin is mm -hmm. uh, at Juilliard, and um, I spent a lot of years with Gene Franklin. And then I spent a lot of years um, at the Barrow Group. And then in LA, I spent time with Sandy Marshall and Larry Moss. And um, I have never stopped training. So I've always been in training. 
And then I ended up teaching for some of these people at a uh, lower tier level. And so for me, uh, and, I, and Sandy Marshall is, is a Meisner teacher. And, I'm, uh, and, and, and I also studied with Stella Adler, at the Stella Adler, not just at the conservatory. And I studied in Circle in the Square. So I, I've never stopped training. And so for me, the cultivation of knowledge about the craft of acting, I can't get enough of it. It's like, I feel like every time I turn around, I want to read a new book about it. I want to understand more, more about it. And now I teach it. But I'm a Meisner trained actor who also comes from a, a, a Stella Adler platform of imagination and choice tactic work. So I married a philosophy of tactical uh, the ability to, to look at work as tactics instead of just um, objectives and, and loose gray kind of emotional through line that you don't really have clear, concise, tactical outlines mm -hmm. that you then let go of and relax and trust that your body will intuit them mm -hmm. by spontaneity. Mm -hmm. I work from spontaneity and intuition based on tactics that then work off my Meisner work. And so I taught him the tactical spontaneity because he already had all the foundational Juilliard body and voice work. And when I gave him the, the dialogue and the, and the vocabulary to work in his spontaneity in a way that he never had to think about it, it changed everything for him. And that's what changed things. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, at Juilliard, I really, was John Sticks teaching when you were there? No. So, yeah. so John would have been, John taught us yeah. our first year and he was the chance for me to kind of have that kind of training, but I, it scared me and I mistrusted it. And I, I gravitated toward the more physical uh, outside in approach at, at Juilliard, which served me well for a time. Mm -hmm. But, but then, you know, then, you know, she came along and I was like, mm -hmm. hey, maybe this, maybe I should pay attention to, to some of this. And it really and has changed the way I- It took me a long time to be able to understand it and do it. And I think I understood it more through trying to articulate and teach it and watch other people get it. And I learn more and I try to tell that to my students all the time. I'm like, you learn more from watching other people mostly, mm -hmm. most of the time than doing it yourself. And you also learn more from being bad and failing, which you don't get the luxury of doing when you're on a job. Mm. When you're on the job, you might get to do another take and you didn't do the take exactly right. But that's not really just failing and not doing and making bad choices or misunderstanding everything and getting to get guided through with someone you trust and really learning why mm. the text doesn't support what you're picking or why the text would be much more easy and free if you went in this other direction. You don't have that luxury. And a lot of directors don't know how to talk to you that way. So if you're in class, you get to learn what it feels like to be wrong so that you understand the feeling when you're right. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen in the actual work a lot. You just walk away feeling like, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I just don't know why. You just know it didn't really, you didn't get into that groove. You just, you did okay because you have good foundation. You have good skill. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you didn't get that. You didn't get in that, that channel. And you, you know, you didn't get in that channel and you're like, why didn't I get in that channel? And why didn't somebody help me? Yep. And if you get in class, you start understanding what happens when you don't get in there mm. and what the, what the miss was, what you missed slipping into that channel. And you're like, oh, I get it. Or you hear the wrong direction and you can translate it. Mm. You can really go, oh, I know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. but you didn't say it right. So you can translate it into something that's an actual active tactic that switches everything for you so that you don't end up thinking. Yeah. And it takes practice. You know, Meisner used to say it takes 20 years to be a great actor. He didn't mean you can't be a good actor. He means it takes 20 years to be so relaxed that you never have to think again. Ooh. Yeah. It happens. That'll be a great day. I know. I'm waiting. I'm <laughs> no. It's be over. You guys you're are a wonderful no. actor. It's but a, believe me, you're a fantastic un, it's actor. It's unattainable. But it's a, it, that's how we, I feel. We just keep trying. <laughs> and we, 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 do, we get better and better and better. Yes. We do pretty well. Pretty yeah. well. And other people think we're great, but we know. Yeah. Well, and you know, we do have we great, know. you do have great moments. And you have great performances. And you have great times. And that's, and that's why you keep doing it. Is you're like, I'm going to feel like that again. I'm yeah. going to feel like that again. Yeah. yeah. I did audit a Larry Moss class in LA. Ah. Um, in the fall, okay. 2019. That was so moving. Yeah, he's really, did you like audit his class or one of his teachers? 
Oh, good. Because he lets you audit his, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, he's great. And, uh, and then you should go audit Sandy Marshall. So I'll give you her information. But she is, doesn't advertise on. You can't get to her except through, um, uh, except through a, a referral. So I have to send you to her directly or you can't get in her class. Wow. So, but you should go audit her class too. She's wonderful. Yay. So I'll send you hers at some point too. She's great. Do you have a plan? Is, do you know when you're going to like go back to LA or what do you think? I think I'm going to um, go back late September, for better or worse. I, yeah. I actually live with one of my best, dearest, oldest friends from Interlochen. She's a musician and uh, she spent most of quarantine with her boyfriend at his place. But anyways, I want to spend time with her. I love our home. Um, my birthday is in October and I kind of want to spend it with, I don't know, my, yeah. my beloved friends and I've yeah. had an incredible year with my parents. I love my parents, but yeah. just, just a change of scenery. We all kind of need that if we can get it this year, I think. And, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm going to try and make my way back and see, see how it goes. Do you hear uh, stories of film and TV production starting up or what I don't, cause I'm not, I'm not plugged into that. What's going on? Yes, especially in Canada and Europe. Um, had a few self-tape auditions for that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I do know a few shows that are starting in November, um, okay. October and November to shoot. Many of them are requiring that every actor in it quarantines for two weeks in their hotel room before shooting. Yeah. Yeah, that makes oh. sense. That's hard, but that makes sense. Is that um, something you would do? If I got a job. Yeah. <laughs> right? If I got a good job. You pay me, I'll do it. I can watch cable and have room service for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I would definitely cross that bridge. But, uh, and then lots of, you know, uh, I was talking to a friend who does locations on Yellowstone, the TV show Yellowstone, and he has to get a test once a week, and the actors have to get tested three times a week. Right. Um, so there's lots of tests, and um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the norm. I know in the couple of theaters that got permission, they have they all have to be quarantined away from each other, even when they're not in the play, and then they have to be tested three times a week. So they're like. They're not even allowed access to each other. And I think the play there even have to be 10 feet away from each other on stage. It's really, and they're in a community that has like 0 0.3 infection rate. It's in the Berkshires. It's well, in the you Berkshires. Know, you've been in the Berkshires. And you've been you in the Berkshires. Is, yeah. So it's way out there. And they're, to other than that, they're not really granting any theater access. But I mean, the audience has to be masked and 25 feet away from the stage. So Will the numbers in a capacity? town for a theater, what's that? Will they be at half capacity? Yeah, and it's out, it has to be outside. They have to be outside. Okay. And yeah, it's really tough for theater to get going. And I think the numbers in a town have to be so low of infection that somewhere like Houston, we're way far from getting anything. And yeah. from what I can tell in terms of this, and we're talking about the union, for those of you out there that don't know what we're talking about, the union sets up criteria for um, giving permission for their union artists to work and putting a safe environment set of stipulations upon what it means to produce a safe production amidst amidst COVID. So there's a lot of things and that's what Auden is talking about with um, theater, I mean with movies. They, the way they're setting up how people can shoot in the same proximity and around each other. Is that the union? Is that SAG driving that or is that the production companies? Do you know? So something I heard is that the insurance companies oh, yeah. are uh, the ones that are stipulating all the things that they say this, 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 this. And it's really, it's epic. I, I listed like two things of probably hundreds. Yeah, so that's that, how I said, yeah, it's epic over there in the Berkshires. Yeah, so in order to get funded, they have to do all this stuff. And if yeah. that's, you know, just like it's really heartbreaking for theater, for indie projects, it's impossible. They don't have the money to do all that stuff. So it's just only the highest funding level of stuff is going to be made for a while until... Vaccines come in December. <laughs> That's what we're hoping. Because the same thing for us. Small theaters just can't meet the financial criterion to set up the set up the situation where we could actually produce a play. We don't have the money. 
because also artists cannot be can't have to pay for their tests. So the theater has to pay, and it's 120 a test if you have to test people three times a week. It's just a it's the yeah, and that's there's so many things. Yeah. What have you guys been doing? This podcast, this is amazing that you've yeah. been doing this. Are you dreaming about what the seasons will be when you yeah. start again? Are you well, we hope we can just produce our 10th season, which was, um, we already announced it, obviously, and we've pushed it back. Mm -hmm. And we've, you know, we want to, we had, we've closed River Between Riverside and Crazy, which is a Stephen Adley Gerges play um, that was really good and we got a really nice little kickoff for a weekend. And we've kept the setup. Why, why take it down? So the set's sitting in our theater and we're hoping we're gonna kick off when we start back with that play. But it is a seven person play. It's everybody's close together, um, which is one of those things that you would think, well, maybe you do a two person play when you start, you know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's our hope is to kick that back off in January. I can't even tell you know. what it's like. This happened yesterday to me. I walked in this, this, we're in the building where our theater is, we're upstairs, it's downstairs. And I walked into that, theater you know and I'm we're both in the show acting in the show and I walked in and I, I looked at that set and was like oh my god what you're still here that's horrible I'm so sorry that I've been neglecting you set and play and you know I don't even know my lines anymore I know that's what I thought was I'm gonna have to learn, to learn my lines, lines again. again that's the worst part of it but we just <laughs> you know we keep making plans audio yeah. and then we change them mm -hmm. like everybody else in town yeah in yeah. the country in the world everywhere yeah that's it's the it's just a financial mess for people to be able to kind of try to jump that hurdle it's i think it's what well, most of us are, that are in the theater that especially are small and i know i think small indie films it's until there's a vaccine none of us can jump the financial burden and that's why so many of us and i know find i know independent film i have some independent film producer friends are all talking about the fundraising is so vital right now it's like if for all of us who are small, the theaters, and for those of you watching, if you support anybody in the arts, don't give up on them during this time because supporting your financial, you know, your arts, small music groups, theater groups, indie, indie filmmakers, any nonprofit. any nonprofit, you have to support them right now because if you don't, they're going to be gone. Yeah. We're actually seeing yeah. that the support has not really dropped off it's yet. It's been good. Uh, yeah. You know, so. We're, but it's, it's really important that people stick with their, their loves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll be back for sure yeah um, oh yeah and we wanted to mention though too right we do want to see uh that you got to be reunited with one of our other houstonian legends that i think is like one of the greatest actresses of our day here in houston you got to do a beautiful show i think that was one of the ones where we asked you to come here and you couldn't because you'd already committed to that oh, maybe she doesn't know what you're talking about heartbreak yet. house heartbreak house oh. Picture. With Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, Elizabeth Heflin. I think that, that you had already, that that was something you were doing and we had asked you about something here, but I can't remember. Because I feel like I remember you telling me that. I was like, oh, well, you have to do that. Yes, because I adore Elizabeth Heflin. Oh my God, I used to never miss anything she was in. She was one of those people I always looked up to to be, to learn from. So I'm very uh, envious you got to work with Miss Lovely Elizabeth. I know Philip did many times. So, you know, yeah, how was that? It was, well, first of all, a lifelong dream come true because <laughs> as a kid, I was obsessed. Um, <laughs> I would just, yeah, I would watch her um, in Christmas Carol and all the shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember Queen of the Nan. Really loved her in. Um, well, you were in Crucible with her at the alley. We were all, we all did Crucible. Yeah. Together, but you didn't have a scene. But you were, her. and you were young. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I always, um, anyway, sorry, I got distracted, but uh, it was Heartbreak House and she can do anything. And it was amazing to get yeah. to act with her and uh, um, wonderful human. She, she really yeah. is. That's great. And what theater is that again? That she's out in Delaware, right? Delaware, yes, Delaware Rep. Yeah, Delaware Rep. That's great. Yeah. Um, so that's wonderful. And And now you did, and what other theater stuff did you do before you took off? You did that, you did Tispity, She's a Whore. You did a seagull out there somewhere too. I know you did one in school. We have a picture of you doing one in school at Juilliard, uh, which I know uh, is is Nina, yes? Yeah. And then when you did it on the East Coast, do you also do Nina or there's Nina at Juilliard? 
Yes. Um, and then I did it at the Huntington in Boston. Um, okay. Yeah, that those are from the Huntington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and is that Nina as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, That's what I assume. So what was that like to do that role twice in what? Three years? Two years. Two years. Wow. Was it a good experience? So Julia was 2011. I guess it was a year and a half later. Um, hmm. It was. It was. They're such different experiences. Um, Richard and Carolyn directed the one at Juilliard. And, um, but it was so cool to do, just to approach it again from a different place. Um, Mariah Aitken directed it in Boston, wonderful British director. And um, Kate Burton. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. past. I would love to do more theater. I, I think it's it's been hard for me to juggle that choice and agents and managers often will always want you to to um, you know be available or focus on things. Yeah. Also, theater in New York is very competitive. I audition for lots of stuff and you don't get it, you know? It's, yeah. So it's not that I didn't, I haven't tried and um I miss it and I I want to do more and want to see more again. And do, you yeah. have the, do you have a relationship with your agent or manager? I don't know exactly what you have, but that was always a thing when I was in New York. I'd say, I want to do a play and they'd, they, or I, I was in a play and they'd be like, you gotta, gotta, you gotta audition with TV and movies. We want you to, to audition for TV and movies because it makes everybody so much more money. Mm -hmm. they hate it when they it's actually when they easier to get a theater job in New York if, you do that, <laughs> if you've been in film but, too and not uh, a theater job that pays you more money too yeah <laughs> a, little, a little more anyway so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah I think actually I was when I got 30 something I was close to getting scout on Broadway Oh, in the, 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 the Kill a Mockingbird that's playing on Broadway? Yeah, oh, wow. Like a, yeah. yep. I um, had to put myself out of the running because if there'd been, I, I think, you know, it, it could have caused a, a bad thing. Who knows if I even would have gotten it. But I do feel like my manager and agent at this point, I really love them. I really respect them. I think it's mutual. Um, that has not always been the case in oh. the you know, in the years since sure. graduate, it's been tricky to find that partnership and that dynamic. But I think that if, when all this is over, <laughs> um, I could, we could have a conversation and they would, they would understand, especially, yeah, yeah I think so. I, well, I think that, you know, that's, that's, I think most agent manager relationships are tricky. I, I've had, you know, uh, long relationships with agents and you have great time for everything seems to work like clockwork and then periods of time where you just can't get on the same page just like in life just like you are with your significant other or your parents at certain times <laughs> or your siblings sometimes you all have the best time of your life and other times you think if i don't get away from you i'm going to just scream right. and that's life so yeah, yeah. Yes. important relationships are not easy yeah yeah worthwhile they're good that's right good they're gonna have hard times so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tricky. I always, uh, in hindsight, I always, I, I think, gosh, I wish I would have approached that relationship more like, hey, agent, you're working for me, and here's what I want. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas it, it really never felt that way to me when I was, especially in LA, it was like, I was always afraid to lose them as, as my advocate. And right. so uh, very much afraid of doing the wrong thing, always wanting to please them. Right. Um, yeah. I think it's a hard thing though. I think, you know, I think this is a good conversation to have about agents. My experience has been, and I have lost agents, is by being too demanding. And I think, because I think it's a compromise. They, they're working very hard for you and sometimes you don't see what they're doing for yeah, you. And so you have to remember that, you know, they aren't just trying, they, they don't not care. They they just have to try to make a balance between where you're going to work and where you're not going to work. And if they think you're just wasting your time doing a bunch of stuff that you're not going to get anyway, or it's going to pay you $200 a week when they could book you on 30 something or, you know, whatever big TV shows coming up, 
it's difficult for them to keep letting you just throw, bang your head against a wall that's not going to work mm -hmm. and not, you know, and you be screaming at them that, why aren't you getting me these jobs where I'm banging my head against the wall for a dollar? Right. And they're like, that's not my job. <laughs> I'm not to get you a dollar. Yes. yes. So you, yeah. you, you got to hear their side too and be able to go, okay, well, I'll go do your 30 something, but then you and I are going to work over the next two years to get me a theater job that pays something that you can feel good about. And I can fill this hole a little bit. Yeah. And that's what I figured out over the years when I lost a couple agents because I wanted a dollar. Mm. And they were like, we're not going to help you get a dollar, you know, no matter what you say to me. Right. And I mean, I'm using that as a metaphor. You know, we have to find some place where your career is going somewhere and we're all profiting and you're still feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's interesting that you have this time to reflect. Though, yeah. I mean, it must be. Have you found anything? But yeah. Well, have you found this positive in some kind of way? I mean, COVID is so difficult and we've talked so much about all the negatives, but I have had some positive experience from my own personal reflection yeah. in this period about figuring out where I don't want to waste my time and where I do want to put my time as we move forward. And has this been a period where you've found some good reflection time and gotten clearer on who you think Auden is and where Auden wants to move in the future or do you still just feel like you were doing a good job of that before and you're just waiting and there's not a right or wrong answer i think i think it's a mix i think it is both actually because i do feel those nine months i was in la before COVID hit i feel like i worked for years to get to that place where i just felt that, that way in my body and in my life and in my um like advocacy for myself and trust in the universe and joy in the craft. And, um, and cause the twenties were kind of a mess. A lot of the twenties were a mess. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> it felt like a, thank you. It felt like a culmination. It felt like this moment about to kind of like, uh, and then this hit, and I think a lot of, everyone feels like that in different ways because of this. It's like, almost like your agency has been taken out of your life and you're like, I don't, the, where does the momentum go now? Where does it go? But at the same time, I think there have been a lot of gifts. I think we'll continue to see them in retrospect too, but um, collectively and individually. I think individually, I feel even more like carpe diem. Joie de vie. Like, let's date, let's <laughs> audition, let's do things. Like, um, just makes you really have this sense of what you already had and what, and like, how, yeah, how precious that time is and, and your choices. And um, yeah, so that's a strengthening that, I think. Well, I think that's great. That's good advice. That carpe diem is a good piece of advice. I think it's very true. And I think uh, putting things on hold or waiting for anything is a, is a, I learned too, that's like, that's a bad mistake. What are you waiting for? Yeah. You know, it's like, what do you think you're gathering your forces for or something? People who kind of think I, I'm, I'm preparing, I'm gathering things. I'm like, no, just do go, just yeah. do it. Just yeah. go do whatever you need to do now yeah. and put everything out there right now. And, yeah. and you guys have done an amazing job. You're better for it. You really have. It's very inspiring. Um, wow. I want to take writing classes. Like when this Oh, he's writing a play. <laughs> Whoa, wow. Yeah, yeah. that's oh, what he great. decided something to do I, to stimulate I himself. I really didn't want the public to know. <laughs> Oh, now Look, it's like nobody ever thing. has to read it. He's I, just doing it. I haven't been, I, for the first two months of three months, four months of COVID, I just, I, I, I didn't know what was going on and I couldn't be creative. Mm -hmm. Right. I just didn't have a creative outlet. And finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to write something. And I did it. And mm -hmm. now I'm working on it. So, it doesn't matter if nobody just, ever sees it. I work it's an just hour a day on something. that thing. And it's, it's, it's the best, wow. second best hour of my day. Wow, that's the best yeah. hour of my days having golf. dinner with my wife. Oh, I thought it was golf. No. Whatever. He's, you know, I don't think it's me, but that's okay. No, that's I just, 10 years know, I think we need, we're creative people and we don't, we've, our creative outlet has been taken from us by mm -hmm. COVID. And I know that, yeah. So I'm not surprised to hear you say that. That's, yeah. yeah. But I also was going to enforce something you're saying about how everything was really coming together and, and, and all the work you've done was coming to the place where you felt really at peace and together and in your space and, and, um, 
you know, just for me to be, to enforce that that's, that's still going to be where you take off from when this all comes back, yeah. because everybody stopped at the same place and nobody else has like been spared COVID. So the, everybody's waiting to yeah. pick back up, you know, so we're all in this space of, of, you know, being just on pause. Mm -hmm. And when the pause is lifted, everyone's going to go back and embrace those people they were, they were running with and doing things with when it stopped and say, let's get back to business. So those people are going to be right at your door going, I'm so excited to get you back over here and either do this show or another show or whatever it may be. So it's just a pause for you to be with you and your family and write something or do something. Do you guys have done the artist way? Yes, I've done that. I did that in the, I did it probably before you were born. I haven't done it. <laughs> Have My favorite thing every week was the artist date. I would go somewhere all by myself, a museum, a movie, a walk in the park. I loved the little artist date and coloring. I love to color. I still have coloring books at the beach. Cool. Yeah. yeah. How do you like it? Are you doing it? I did it a few years ago and I think I'll do it again another point in my life. It helped. I mean, it would actually probably would have been helpful during, during quarantine, but mm. um, when I was unemployed for a long time and that yeah. same feeling that has happened this year a little bit of like a lot of it in different ways but of like where do I put the energy where do I put it yeah. and you know just taking a ceramics class or yeah. going to a museum like there are so many different ways to be an artist yeah um, to, to feel lit up in that way I loved it morning pages were hard for me I kind of slacked on those yeah. the writing aspect I it was I made me think that you're writing I have a I have like Ten journals at my house that I would be frightened to read now. <laughs> From the artist way, they're probably really scary. From when I lived in LA, I did it. I think when I lived in LA, so I was actually probably thirty. I, I probably did it, you know, but twenty years ago, but still, so, almost uh, before you were born. Well, I'm Thornton. It's amazing to me every time we do one of these that an hour goes by. I know. It feels like nothing. We've been talking for an hour, and we promised you we wouldn't take up any more of your time. But so we we usually end these by asking. Do you have a story from oh. theater? It could be film. Like the, the story about the thing that went wrong. Something funny or something that, some you know. Silly, that, crazy you know, story. You know, you know the story. Yeah, you got a good theater story or a film story? You got one for us? You don't have to. I'm sure I have more than this, actually, especially with theater. But um, the one that comes to mind, sort of a karma story. It was at school. We were doing... Uh, Macbeth, third year, I was one of the witches. I have to tell you, I'm not proud of this, but I had a drink before the show. I think I had oh. two margaritas with my castmates, my castmates. We didn't usually do this. Other people at the school did party a lot. I, I'm not a big drinker. Anyways, for some reason, <laughs> drink before the show. I don't condone that. I've never done it since. <laughs> It's, yeah. This is great yeah. so far. <laughs> and I was witch number two, I think, and do the first scene around the fire, and then we're supposed to run off through the smoke off stage. <laughs> end of my dress, sort of sees the universe being like, never do this again, catches on the stairs, and I truly go like that and just oh. <laughs> face plant <laughs> as I'm running through the smoke onto the ground oh no very hard to get up um oh. i did not feel drunk during any part of it but you know I, just a little slow on the reaction a little off on the guilt yeah. a bit guilty that's, like you didn't that's my fault that that, 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 that well i'm sure you're not the first person who drank on stage oh like my God, you should no. talk to kathleen <laughs> turner <laughs> she was like drunk through the entire production of who's afraid of virginia wolf my understanding is so yeah we but don't know we don't know that's Kathleen. a rumor yeah. sorry Kathleen. Kathleen. theater does not that's condone right. that comment <laughs> i just that's a rumor i'm just repeating a rumor <laughs> i can't handle my liquor well so i i i don't i don't risk it <laughs> oh god well, I was good. I'm sure I missed that because I'm sure it was funny. I fall down a lot. I just fell in glass menagerie and ate it backstage just like that. Flat on my face. I knocked the lights down, everything. It was, <laughs> I had a cut knee, come out blood coming down my knee. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, welcome to the fall down club. It's a great place to be. <laughs> right. In film, you can just cut and do it again. Right. No yeah, sure. It's terrifying. Just get up and keep going. Yep, yep. <laughs> 
Oh man, guys, thank uh -huh. you so much. It's very, very good to see you. Oh yeah, thank you so much. We are so proud of you. You're such an inspiration to everybody here in Houston. And hopefully we'll be seeing you on television very, very soon. Hopefully, this is so Yay! Cool. I'll see All you right. guys. Yes, good night. Thank you so Take much, Take care Lottie. of yourself. Take care. Bye-bye. Beyond the Fourth Wall is produced by Fourth Wall Theater Company, Houston's home for extraordinary performances up close. Each guest is paid for their appearance on this series in accordance with our mission to pay artists a living wage. Follow the links in the video description to support Fourth Wall with a tax-deductible gift or to subscribe to our upcoming 10th anniversary season. Good, 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 good. There was a while ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Oh, she's like, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on.